Interesting. Um, on the social side, I'm going I'm to um, um, break the consensus. And obviously, uh, I'm guessing you feel that Mr. Blair is not a neoconservative socially, or, or is he? Um, it, uh, it covers, um, or the, the term covers a range of issues on which uh, he certainly isn't neoconservative. And principally, the, um, the stress on welfare reform that you got in the Clinton presidency and Clinton administration, it is there rhetorically in Mr. Blair's views, but I think we would all agree that it hasn't really been effected in practice. Um, there Does he is want a, to be a neocon, and is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm sure, I, I'm sure he doesn't uh, wish to be seen as a neocon. Um, the reason um, I adopted the term in, in the book that you kindly referred mm. to is uh, not that I think it, it is a particularly precise descriptive term, but because those of us who uh, support the position of liberal democratic internationalism as it used to be, or humanitarian interventionism as it's now called, get called neoconservative so often that rather like the early Methodists uh, who, who found that term was, uh, was, was leveled against them as a term of abuse, we might as well accept it and just get on with it. Um, I think that in, in his, um, in his uh, moral beliefs, and I do accept that there is a moral underpinning to what he says, um, there is, it's, it's to me the least attractive feature of New Labour, there is a moral authoritarianism that I find uh, uh, probably uh, more to the neoconservatives' taste than to mine. But broadly speaking, I see him in the tradition of social democracy at home, liberal democratic internationalism abroad, and as the term neoconservatism is used quite so prolifically, one might as well buckle down to it, accept it, and just argue on the issues. It is used prolifically, and this actually neatly ties into the, uh, the second part of what we're saying. Obviously, um, there has been a lot of um, hostility to neoconservatism based on, firstly, stories of cabals, obviously, stories of, um, well, Iraq and Afghanistan are going wrong because of what you guys actually uh, said we should be doing. Um, is there a place for neoconservatism, uh, Stephen Parkinson, in our foreign policy today? Or has it led us down a blind alley? Well, as I say, the, 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 my problem with neoconservatism is that... It, it adds an ideological element to foreign policy which gets in the way of um, the ends that a lot of us might, might agree with. I'm, as a, as a conservative, um, and the world is a better place without Saddam Hussein. Um, uh, but whether Iraq is a better place is up for discussion. And, and whether this, the, the adventure that we've gone on in the Middle East has led us to a, a stronger position in foreign policy is highly debatable by any... Um, estimation, the war in Iraq was a, was a terrible disaster. We've lost 120... I don't think by any estimation. Well, by we, some we, estimation. Yeah, but, okay, but by, by, by the estimation of 120 UK troops dead and over 2,500 Americans, not to mention the, the tens of thousands of Iraqi civilians. Um, uh, also, isn't that more is one estimation. Is that tactical well, or strategic? Well, I mean, surely on the strategic point of view, we were quite right to go in. And yes, look, even Condoleezza Rice have admitted thousands of mistakes have happened on the tactical level, but surely on the strategic level, the morality element, we were quite right to go. You yourself well, acknowledged. You'd have, to have made, yes. you'd have had to have made the equation before we went in that well, the, uh, the liberation of Iraq wasn't worth 120 British soldiers. Well, if you want to make that yeah. calculation, we could. Well, certainly, but, but there are different means to achieve the ends of regime, regime change, and there are means other than war. I'm, I'm not a, a peacenik, I'm not one of these people who says never war, but that it should, it should be as a last resort. And I think the, the war that we've got You have to agree that after 15 years it was a last resort. We, it was a hardly a, a hurtle to war in 2003. Well, it, well, it was, um, it was, Saddam Hussein had been given a fair amount of time. There was, there, there, um, there was a very I didn't see a rush. I think there's a danger of getting bogged down in a discussion that <laughs> is very important, but we will not conclude. And sure. that is the merits and demerits of the Iraq war, on which Douglas and I are on one side. What I think it tells us about the neoconservative debate is this. As a liberal with a small L, I think that post-war Western foreign policy had much to commend it, the fact that we contained and ultimately defeated through the means of collective security um, Soviet totalitarianism is a, an enormous historic achievement. But there were great costs in post-war Western foreign policy, in particular a willingness on the part of the United States, our principal ally, the leader of the free world, to align themselves with uh, a motley crew of authoritarian regimes in various regions, not least, for example, Latin America as well as the Middle East. Um, 
As a liberal, I find this morally abhorrent, but as a realist as well in international relations, I think it was entirely counterproductive. Absolutely. To me, the earlier discussion we had about the distinction between foreign policy idealism and realism is now otiose. It has no particular content because the conditions of autocracy in the Middle East are what have led us to this yeah. outburst, to this burgeoning right. well, of religious basically, fanaticism and terrorism. Stephen, do you want to come no, back? No, no, yes. Let's talk about the realism of, of what we've done in Iraq. We, we, we've taken one of the most notably secular states in the, in the Middle East well, and turned it into a, into a training ground for, for well, fundamental um, Iraq Islam, not, Islamic terrorism. Iraq was not a secular state. It was a, it was a uh, an Islamist sponsoring, uh, the, 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 and it was a training ground for religious fanaticism. But I mean, I mean simply on the realist grounds, I mean, this is what we have to come back to, is, is the interesting thing that happened after 9-11 in the American administration, and I think has happened here, is that I mean, neocons haven't taken over the world or haven't even got much sway in, in many uh, parts of government here in America. But what has happened is that the realists, the Cheneys and the Rumsfelds, have understood that it is no longer realistic to be propping up regimes in the Middle East, which make the uh, inhabitants of those countries hate you, and which, uh, um, and which you end up feeling the effects of on the streets of New York and in the streets of London. That's not, if, if there's any realism in that, where is it? If there was any realism in the Kissingerian policy of that, I've yet to see it. So in your view, we need it because it's the only viable strategy. The only viable strategy, aside from being the only moral strategy, it's the only viable strategy they're not being, uh, in the years to come, continual blowback from propping up regimes which neither we nor the occupants of Middle Eastern countries want to be treating with. But, 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 but where, where is the realism of riding roughshod over international opinion through multilateral organizations? What does international and, opinion and, and, and mean? Erod international opinion means nothing when it it's the UN. It means nothing when it's international law. It means nothing when you've got a country it, like Cuba it, 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 it means that you, we, we couldn't imagine a situation now where President Bush or Tony Blair took their respective countries to war because the international opinion is so highly stacked against them because we, of the way they, because the way they did it. Sovereign and, and armies and can't go to war from Britain and America because of international... What is this international well, we, 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 we're going to a whole different debate. We're going Last to a word debate. from Oliver on the subject. I'm not quite with Douglas on this. Foreign policy is not a branch of theology. You have to weigh costs and benefits. I do think, however, that the supposedly realist position does not deal with the counterfactual. What would have happened if we had allowed this aggressive, grotesque regime to persist? The international community is not a fiction. But the problem with the UN is that it is not a sovereign body. It does not have the means to implement its resolutions. I'm going to stop it there for the moment.